Welcome to Discover Indie Film. I'm your host, Jeff Howard, and this is really fun for me. I've got Dwayne Anderson here. Not quite here. He's on Zoom. Hey, Dwayne. Hey, Jeff. Dwayne and I met at the Sherman Oaks Film Festival just last year in 2022 because his film, 30 Meetings, 30 Days, was an official selection, and I'm just going to make him suffer and rattle off all your awards. 30 Meetings, 30 Days, one, Best Featurette Drama, Best Director, Best Lead Actress, Best Performance by a Cast, Best Screenplay, and to top it off, Best Cinematography, which I thought was extra cool. I, I guess I should have named, uh, but I say best lead, obviously a uh, writer and director is you. Lee, oh, I didn't copy and paste the lead actress's name, but it's uh, Emily, Emily Goss. Goss. Emily Goss. Emily Goss. Wow, I could remember that. I must have just read it like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> and uh, nice But I talk. do have, uh, and your cinematographer was Bianca Klein. Yep. Yeah. So just uh, an excellently made film all around. Uh, the jury just obviously ate it up. Just a yeah. brilliant film. And then Dwayne actually sent me a link to uh, a feature he made back in, I guess, 2016, 2017. is when you finished it, I imagine. Yeah, no, it came out in 2006. It, it premiered at festivals in 2016. I think it was released finally in like early 2017. Early right. 2016. And, and that's called Super Powerless, so we'll be able to talk about both. I didn't confirm this with you, but Amaletto, right? If people want to watch 30 Meetings, right. 30 Days, uh, you, they can just go to the Amaletto website and search for it or go Amaletto is essentially a YouTube channel. Yeah, I think that, if you uh, just kind of type in 30 meetings, 30 days, movie, YouTube, Amaletto, something like that, it should come up. Yeah. I don't know right now we're at May, what are we, May uh, 5th or something like that? And uh, May 4th. And I don't know exactly when it's going to drop on their site. Sometime oh, gotcha, gotcha. Well, people can, people can keep their eyes open for it on Amaletto. I have a lot of respect for Amaletto. In fact, I often say to myself, they're a little smarter than me, whoever runs that, because this podcast gave birth to a TV series on Amazon Prime. And uh, boy, if I thought of the YouTube thing, it probably would a lot more eyeballs would be on it. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's a it's a crapshoot. Who knows? We'll see how we do. I'm yeah. Sure. Well, so I slipped it in. So, yeah. So if people are interested in indie film and you probably should be if you're listening to this, you can go to Amazon Prime Video and search for Discover Indie Film. And currently there are seven seasons of short films handpicked from the festival circuit. Uh, it does cost 99 cents per episode or seven ninety nine per season. But you are, uh, you know, paying eight dollars to see about twenty five really well made self financed short films. So, you know. Eight bucks to support indie filmmakers who spent a lot more than eight bucks on their work is uh, not a huge ask. We used to be free include with Prime, and then we climbed up to like 10,000 unique viewers a week, and they said, hey, we want you to charge instead. Because turns out it's their servers and it's their rules. I think it's fair. So anyway, no more of that. We'll just jump right into the interview part. I already warned Dwayne. I'm just going to say... You know, you're. Uh, I've seen two films now. I I recognize. I, I I enjoyed in our preamble before we started recording. I called you a storyteller, because I think it's very clear that you are a storyteller, um, a very skilled, particularly with film. But uh, when did you first get the storytelling bug? When did you uh, get the hints that you were a creative? Yeah. Um... Again, uh, <clears throat> I always was. I mean, I always wrote stories, drew pictures. I mean, that was just what I did. I decided I would be a filmmaker at the age of nine. Um, the uh, When I was nine years old, a buddy and I got on a, a public bus. You know, it's a totally different era. Nine, two nine-year-olds on a public city bus. And we went to the local movie theater and I saw my first grown-up movie i can't say adult movie anymore because that's that uh that could be confusing but i, I saw my first grown-up movie it was uh silver streak with uh, gene wilder and richard pryor and uh you know for a kid who'd only seen disney movies and stuff on tv um <clears throat> and i'd watch a lot of stuff on tv by then but um but you know i had language and i had sexuality and i had violence and 
and it was really funny and I thought it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen you know I just I just was so just tantalized and I left not I left really literally wanting to be a, a filmmaker so yeah, I just want to make stuff like that I just thought that was incredible and so, I love the silver streak is your uh was your inspiration that's uh, for those who aren't our age yeah we grew up watching movies on tv that were heavily edited heavily all the bad words dubbed all the interesting scenes cut out with <laughs> with long periods of commercials in there yeah so yeah i imagine that might have been an r-rated movie no it was pg it was pre-pg PG. 13 but it was pg um I don't uh, think PG-13 existed back then, but no, no, I, I don't it, mean to be it ticky It wasn't for a while. It wasn't for a while. And um, and it was good. I mean, it, there's nothing really, you know, bad about it. It's not, um, you know, it's not like I wouldn't, sh you know, it would be a mild PG-13 now, you know. But it was That's sexual, true. That's true. You know, and, um, and um, it was great. And then so I sort of had these three pillars. Uh, so there's that. And then <laughs> when I was... Just a couple years later, I went and saw Star Wars. And I, I am always like, I went with a friend. Again, these are always with friends. In fact, two of them were with the same friend. Um, I went and saw Star Wars. And um, it was opening weekend on a Saturday morning, you know, like around 11. And, and you know, I always pity like young people now who who didn't have that experience of like just the mind blowing experience of watching star Wars in the theater without knowing what it was. Right. Just not being prepared for it. And just suddenly seeing this thing, you know, it's absolutely incredible. And then a few years after that, when I was 16, the same kid that I saw silver streak with, he had won over the radio, some tickets to the, West Coast premiere in San Francisco of Ingmar Bergman's Fanny and Alexander. And so as a 16 year old kid, I walked in there with my, it was black tie event and I was wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt, you know, and we walk in there and all of a sudden I see Fanny and Alexander, which is a three hour art movie. And, and each of those movies just sort of like completely like rocked my world as far as what the cinema experience is. And I say those are my sort of three pillars, you know, as far as my film. I mean, there's a lot of other sort of key things in between, but. Uh, yeah. And were you like writing short stories and stuff? Were you just sort of a creative kid anyway? But well, then I, was, I started making like sort of... Super 8 movies when I was like 10. Yeah. And I was always in theater. So I was acting. And, um, and, uh, but like the, I wrote my first feature length screenplay when I was 14. And um, it was hysterical. I was in some, uh, you know, freshman English class where she said, any, you get one for every page of outside writing, you, you write, you get a certain amount of extra credit. So I, the next day I dropped this <laughs> typed feature screenplay <laughs> on her desk and, and uh, she transferred me out of the class <laughs> to, to another one. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway. by the way, I, I failed to ask a key question that popped in my head when you first talked about uh, Silver Streak, which is where'd you grow up? I grew up in Palo Alto, California. Oh, NorCal. Right. Right. So, so the so the the premiere in San Francisco was not that far. No, it was just a little drive. The uh, the the. Um, um, so yeah, so it's just about what what is that a half hour south of San Francisco, something like that. I don't yeah. remember. Depending on traffic, but yeah, sure. Uh, for sure. Yeah. yeah, so you grew up in Palo Alto, gotcha. So you're a, a, a Bay Area guy. Yeah, yeah. For Which sure. is actually, I I mean, it feels like a very community, uh, creative. Very much creativity so. Creativity is incurred. Like, it's not. Very much so with an incredible independent and art movie house scene. Uh, we would, I mean, we could see every movie, every cool movie that came out. I mean, I remember seeing, um, and, and I went, you know, I was movie mad. So I, I mean, I have these great memories of like riding my bike when I was 15 to go see Raging Bull and, 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 uh, Kagamushu, Kurosawa's Kagamushu seeing that in the theater. And, and, um, and there was this great, everyone 
who grew up around my age, you know, 10 years after, 10 years before, or 30 years before, probably, uh, talks about this theater, The New Varsity, which was would just show older, not older movies, like, but they weren't, you know, we didn't have video stores yet, right? And so so um, they would just show these re-releases and they'd curate them. They'd generally do like double features. Um, and uh, like I went and saw, I went and saw, um, well, I know we saw La Caja Fall 1 and La Caja Fall 2, you know, so they do those little sort of curated back to back. I did, they did a late night thing once where I saw um, Let It Be and um, Magical Mystery Tour, you know, and things like that. And so, uh, so it was just an amazing place to go. When I was a kid, I went there and then for eight mania, they showed like four Planet of the Eight movies in a row, you know? And so, and so just these amazingly cool film experiences and, um, and, uh, you know, everyone I talked to who grew up in that area, who's in film, you know, has like this sort of foundational you know, formative experience. We could all talk about the new varsity with like, oh, that was just where I was learned how to, you know, about movies, you know. For sure, for sure. And I felt like noting, or I feel like noting that your three pillars are such a nice balance. It's almost like Silver Streak is pure entertainment. I mean, comedy thriller. Pryor and Wilder, like they were, they're one of the best comedy teams ever. Yeah, that was their first time they were together and probably their best in my opinion yeah that's right because they should have been together in the blazing saddles but weren't oh that's right yeah they weren't yeah. yeah and then and then star wars is pure imagination especially seeing it at the at the age yeah just pure world building yeah and then and then yeah and then bergman you get pure art so it's yeah. very nice breadth yeah yeah I st- yeah, I, I love the idea of still standing on those three pillars. You know? For sure. All right, so then at some point, uh, you write, you wrote a feature at 14, and, and you you shocked your freshman English teacher and stuff. Uh, did you major in film? Did you start seeking no, out film studies? No, I didn't. Um, I, went to, I went to BYU. We were talking about BYU, which is a religious school, and that's just sort of where I was kind of, urged by my family to go and my older brother was there and he was having a good time so I went and I and I but I wanted to study film but because it was a religious school they like they had these sort of I took the first class and like the very first day the teacher was kind of started ripping into the how depraved the graduate was and at the time the graduate was absolutely my favorite movie. It's still one of my favorite movies, but at that age, boy, the graduate was just like the bomb. And uh, when I was in college, I watched the graduate over and over, including the criterion edition where some film studies professor was doing the commentary over yes. every scene and pointing out yeah. everything that Mike Nichols was doing. I couldn't get enough of that. Oh yeah, for sure. And, uh, and so I just didn't want to study film there. And, and I, um, I uh, and I was an English major for a while because I did want to be a screenwriter, but I just I'm a slow reader. You know, I love reading, but I'm just I'm just slow. I just I just you know I it takes me a while, and I knew I was gonna like have to read all these books fast. I was like, there's no way I'm gonna be able to do that, and so I eventually ended up being an art major, and um, and it, it was for a, in my mind at first it was a segue to film. But then I just dug it, you know, and I, I kind of got into my professors. They were like, they had this like cool life where they would just paint in their, in their time and then show up to school, talk about paint art and look at your paintings and make a few comments and then go back to painting themselves. And I decided that's what I wanted to be. For the first time in my life since I was nine, I kind of had a different career choice, which was now I'm going to be an art professor. And I, so I got an MFA in art and, um, I uh, and did you stay at BYU for the MFA? No, no, too? I was at uh, SUNY Buffalo State University, oh. New York at Buffalo, and then I moved to New York City to be a uh, starving artist, and I succeeded wonderfully at the starving part. And um, and back I when uh, you can uh, back when a starving artist could actually live in the 
city, right? Like, <laughs> no, not really. Oh. I mean, anyway, but I, oh. <laughs> you know, I was doing well. I was doing all right, and and I think my career tra- trajectory at that point was fine. If I wanted to pursue art, uh, I couldn't get any jobs teaching because just like teaching film, most universities don't hire someone like like my brother's a political science professor and he got his PhD and got hired to college. That's the way it works, you know, but in the fields of like art or, or film, you generally want somebody who can teach, who has some actual professional experience. And so I wasn't getting the, getting those jobs. And I eventually had to actually move back to Utah um, just as a sabbatical replacement for somebody um, in my program, they offered me to just come back. And we'd, we'd been in New York for about a year. I, I, I was married at the time. And so we came back and we, it was just going to be a uh, just a, a semester. But I ended up never leaving, which is crazy because as a California kid, when I came out here, I was like, I was like, oh, I hate it here. I hate the Utah, you know, and um, I love it now. I mean, I just completely like kind of changed and I, I love living in Utah now. But um but uh, shortly after that, so I would say probably um, after my graduate program, probably less than two years after my graduate program, I was like, I want to, I want to make movies, you know. And so, and I'd had a big, I'd had a show in Berkeley actually. I'd had an exhibit of my work in Berkeley, and it just didn't do anything. You know, it it wasn't in a gallery. It was in, but it was in this sort of art space in a in a cafeteria. It was a pretty cool space, but it's like you know, it's just stuff on the wall that people don't notice. You know, and uh, and I wanted I wanted to grab an audience. I wanted people to be sitting in seats looking at my work. You know, <laughs> having to having to kind of be face to face with it. And I was like, I just. I just, you know, art is incredible. I love making it. I love like the world of it. I love thinking about it and talking about it, but I just, but I just want to make movies, you know? And so, um, so I started screenwriting again and then in, in my screenwriting, that little momentary screenwriting career actually, again, was a nice trajectory. The, um, my first thing that I wrote then and I'd been writing all my life, you know, but that first thing that I wrote sort of, okay, now I'm going to focus on this instead of going out and painting every night, I'm going to be writing. And uh, the first thing I wrote, I sent around, got an agent, started doing meetings. Um, it was read by a lot of real, really cool people. I had a lot of really cool conversations with people about why they were not going to buy it. And, uh, and eventually um, I, I wrote another one and another one and um And I just kind of got impatient, you know, and I just um, said, well, I want to make something. And so I made something. And and uh, and that thing that I made was this movie based on this Soviet short story called The Old Woman. And it kind of got distributed by this company. It kind of it's still distributed by this company that um, that really focuses on educational media. Right. And so like. There's a few Russian classes throughout the country that like show this movie as part of their curriculum. Um, And that sort of gave me confidence and got me excited about directing. But it also I I, I brought in some crew. It was all like I mean, the whole thing we shot for like a few thousand dollars. Right. But it brought in these young students, these like recent graduate film students to help. And they all started working crews and they they started recommending me. to, to crews and mostly in, in, in art departments. And so I started working crews and then, you know, for the next 15 years or so, I was a, just a full-time crew person, mostly a location manager. And then, um, and then, but I was trying to produce and I met a guy named Dave Boyle. Um, and, uh, he was a young kid, 15 years younger than I, I was. And, and, um, but you know, I immediately saw him as being someone who was super talented and really creative. And he um he was making a film that I came and actually helped him shoot, largely just because I just bought a cool camera and I just wanted to practice on it. So I volunteered and I'm a horrible cinematographer. And um and he made it and it was horrible and he didn't really show it to anyone, but um 
but there were moments of brilliance, right. That were just based on his talent. Right. And so he approached me and said, and at that point I was in my late thirties and um, I had this goal of producing a feature before I was 40. And, um, and he approached me and said, um, Hey, I got a, I got a feature script and I've already raised some money. Would you produce it for me? And I said, yeah, I read the script and, and it, it actually needed a good amount of work, but the act third act was like some of the best stuff I'd ever read. And I said, man, this is so exciting. And so I got on and I kind of helped him with the script, but he did most of it. And, um, and that was a movie was called Big Dreams Little Tokyo. And it played at a lot of festivals. It premiered at AFI and, um, and uh, did well enough that um, we raised uh, money for our second movie, even before that was done with its um, theatrical release. And uh, that movie was called Wine and Rice. And that was made during the financial crisis. We were shooting in 2008 as everything was just imploding. And so it didn't really you know, the whole indie distribution scene kind of changed then. And so we, um, we just, we kind of shifted and we made, we were shooting, I, I, this is my spiel, I've gone on a bit, but what happened is we were, we were shooting pickups for that movie. And it's a movie I really like, but it just didn't really do much. And we're shooting pickups for that movie. And it was just my sim, our cinematographer, Bill Otto, Dave, and myself. We're just shooting like, you know, we'd done most of the editing. We're getting like exteriors and stuff like that. And I, we said, boy, this is fun. Wouldn't it be fun if we just like made a whole movie this way? And so since the, no one had any money at that point to invest in anything, we, um, we made a movie called Surrogate Valentine uh, that we made for like 15 grand. And um, it played a South by Southwest. And that movie really launched Dave's career. Um we made a sequel to that within a year just because the guy who gave us the $15,000 thought it was so much fun. He just gave us another 15,000 just to, to do another one. And then, um, you know, and Dave Boyle is now, he made a movie called man from Reno, which I helped with, but didn't get a credit. I, I got some credit on him, but I didn't really, wasn't really his, his main producer. And, um, and, um, that was nominated for an independent spirit award. And, and, um, now he's shooting a big Netflix, um, series um in japan he's he's bilingual and and so he's shooting it in japan and and um yeah and so and during that time after i started making things with dave a bunch of other people you know i started doing a lot of line producer work and uh and uh you know and so that's sort of my indie career um and then um well and i have a funny a question that i hope it doesn't derail you too much which is oh. Were you in Utah the whole time for all yeah, that? Yeah, I, you... I was in Utah the whole time. Um, I mean, I, I'm just going to add, it's kind of extra impressive to to get all that done away from L.A. in a way, well, you know? Utah because actually has, Utah actually has a pretty cool indie scene. Lots of movies are made here. And it also has a kind of a Hollywood scene. And so there's lots of people who come here to make movies, you know? Um, and... Um, and um, so I was working on those crews and, and, and learning stuff, but I, I eventually started working a lot in LA as well as San Francisco. Um, and um, to the point that I was getting hired as a local in both places, you know, um, where people were just kind of hiring me and then finding out later, I d didn't actually live there. Right. They were um, like, they're like, Dwayne's always around. Let, let's Dwayne's yeah, around. Let's, let's, yeah. let's bring him in. We, cause right. once people know you're good and they can trust you. Yeah. And and that actually, you know, a couple of big projects, like there was this project with the Duplass brothers that I was brought on to be a like a producer for. And I was like, oh, man, this is awesome. And then they found out I did, didn't live there. And I was like, oh, wait a minute, we need you there. And there was another project that was a really big project. It was actually a Greg Araki project that that he wanted me on and then found out I didn't live there and I hadn't shot there yet. I, I, at that point, it, that was based on white and rice. He saw white and rice and, and brought me on as a potential producer. I, I can't remember the name of the film. It was, it was, um, had a funny name. It played a con played a Sundance, but I wasn't part of it. Um, and, uh, and, but it was good because I hadn't, I hadn't shot, I'd only shot like a few days in LA 
And later I produced several movies that were just strictly in LA and, you know, I had a lot to learn. And so I was glad. And not only that, but, and in our interviews, I probably shouldn't say this because, but it's not Greg's fault uh, um, is, um, and I haven't said the name of the film. So, but they got flipped, right. They were non-union. And I remember saying, this is a pretty big project for non-union and I'm not really comfortable doing that in LA. Uh, even though I didn't even know, but my instinct was telling me that that was a bad idea and they did get flipped, which is, uh, which is something that I've had, uh, you know, I've known several people have happened to, but I've always avoided. <laughs> and so, so I've been able to avoid it. Um, anyway, I mean, so anyway, but during all that time, I was a producer. And one of the things that kind of happened to me was, you know, I made that one for sure, that first film, it was kind of a weird film. It was like 50 minutes long. So it doesn't really fit in any category. That first, that's one that's now used for education. But then I made a, a second film that um, that was a short. And I remember coming home to my wife and saying, I just, I don't, I don't think I, I'm not, I don't know. I was directing both of those. I said, I don't know what I'm doing as a director. I don't feel very comfortable, but I, I really am good at the producing stuff. And so that was really my focus until very recently. And the change is that I now am a full-time teacher. So I was hired to start teaching film. And, you know, I don't have to gig. I don't have to, like, get on as a line producer anywhere. And and I could just sort of focus on my own creative stuff. Yeah, so when you became, when you got into teaching, that was after all the... Yeah, that was all the hustling and 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 yeah, not, so I mean I, not I, like you were hustling, but all the working on variety yeah, of projects, I had been, variety of I had been sometimes crewing. line producers, sometimes producers, sometimes this, sometimes that. Yeah, I'd been crewing. Uh I crewed for about 14, 15 years, and then I'd then, you know, from my 40s to by the time I was 50, I'd produced a lot of movies. I'd produced like maybe a dozen features most of them really really small they always like did really well at festivals i've had you know films at all the big festivals and stuff but they just none of them really ever made any money because they were all so, such small films you know and so i always had to like you know make a living editing and doing other gigs you know and um and um and the teaching job came along um really accidentally i never i didn't plan on it but the school nearest my home happened to also have like the best program as far as like, you know, hands-on production. So that's the program where I would always bring out interns and stuff and always had a really great experience. And that was Utah Valley University. And one day in one of those lulls of freelance, right, when it just nothing seemed to be clicking, I was on Indeed and I saw that they were hiring a full-time faculty person so I thought well I've got the MFA from painting but whatever and I just submitted everything and they ended it's the biggest surprise of my life that they hired me and so so but that's been you know now like during the writer's strike and stuff I just you know I'm constantly telling myself man I'm really lucky to have this full-time gig well know? it sounds like getting the gig at the university meant that you could breathe and start thinking about the kind of director or kind of storyteller you want to be yeah absolutely it was good to have a day job especially since you know i've never made any money doing it i really haven't i mean I've, I've i've been paid uh but i've never had that like big i've never like really crashed the hollywood gates i i did this you know i i recently submitted to the nichols fellowship so i'm way that's that's in process right and I did that. I did that years ago with the film, and I became like a, I don't know, one of the finalists. I'm, I, I made like at least the first hoop, I think, which is, um, and that was over a decade ago. It was maybe more than that. Jeez, it was probably like twenty years ago. And um, and um, I, uh, I, I've been writing ever since, but I haven't submitted because I know that there's like this cap on how much money you can have made as a writer. And I've made, you know, $1,000 here, $1,000 there, being hired to write. Uh, people have hired me to write stuff. I, you know, um, Dave Boyle and I wrote a project together that we were paid a little bit for, right? And then, um, and then, um, 
And then the, uh, so I said, I wonder how much it is. I think it's like 5,000. And I know I've done more than 5,000. And uh, I looked and it's like 20,000 or something like that. And I was like, oh, well, I've never done 20. I've never made 20. I've never made that much. I mean, maybe I've made 10, but I've never made 20. So, you know, over over years of, of writing, you know, and so, and so I've never quite like, you know, had that had that payday, even a, even a payday that's like union scale. And so, um, yeah, and probably a lot while well, I'm projecting here, I guess, but probably a lot of the stuff where you'd have something good and someone would, would, uh, ins- not install, I shouldn't put it that way, but like, you know, those $1 options and things that make you think that there's a chance, yeah. that it'll, you know, yeah. Writers don't see a lot until, you know, no, until it's, it's, it's like winning the lottery. Yeah, it's until it's made. Not even not even option or even being filmed until like the yeah. film is made. But it and it's also one of those things where the thing that you learn is in Hollywood, you can have a lot of really exciting things going on without anything happening at all. You know? So you can have movies that people are talking about and having all these meetings and and you feel like this something's happening and then names you know, attached to yeah yeah production scale i actually have a i certainly won't name him but just yesterday a friend told me he just had two things die yesterday like with yeah. with because of the strike i guess but uh yeah but yeah two things that he thought he was actually gonna get a payday because it had names attached and this and that and blah blah, blah and he called all depressed I think it was actually day before yesterday, but yeah, it's, you can be right there feeling like, oh my God, really, really? And then nothing. Yeah. And so there's this sort of Zen thing that, and, and we were talking about being older before we started and, and, you know, I think we're about the same age We're yeah, I'm in my just beyond mid fifties. Yeah. And, I think based upon the ages you gave when uh you saw when films, I was seeing those films. You are you are my 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 older brother's age. We're two years <laughs> apart. So yeah. yeah. So, so basically you know, lived in the same world. And here's the deal is is you know, I mean, I'm sure most people listening to your your uh podcasts are a lot younger than I am. And and um they're who I was when I was in college and in my twenties and then in my thirties and And the thing about it is everyone I know who stopped making movies, stopped making movies, right? But everyone that I know who kept, has kept making movies has found some sort of success, you know? And so that's really what it's about is you just keep going. I mean, I've been able to succeed based on, you know, I mean, I've got... I've already just said I've never really made a lot of money on it, but if you look at my career and my IMDb and whatever that is, and and you know just the cool things I've gotten to do, I've had an awesome career. I've had a lot of fun. I've made a lot of really cool movies, you know, and um, and and uh, you figured out a way to ha- to have food and board by by teaching yeah. and so, and I have a family yeah, like and a home and uh, you know all these good things, and so I kind of have it really good. Um, and, uh, and so you kind of have to get to this Zen place where it's about the work, you know, where it's about just, yeah, I make movies because I love making movies and that's how I express myself. And it's not about being famous, you know, because that is everyone I know who is successful, who, what I call successful, who has a career in the film industry none of them are where they want to be, you know? I mean, Martin Scorsese struggles to get a movie made. So, so you know, I mean, everyone I know, uh, I mean, I know guys who are really, like, famous, you know, um, who, you know, it's not like they can just say, hey, I got a new idea. Let's get, let's go into production. You know, it's really yeah, hard. Not, not unless, not unless they happen to be able to self finance or, or yeah, or make yeah. it micro budget. Yeah, no, you're totally, I mean, it's a, uh, I don't think I've said this on a podcast before, but I met a dude at a barbecue once. We were talking about writing and this is like 20 years ago. And uh, he was impressed that I had something that had actually gone somewhere. He had had nothing go anywhere, but is super talented 
Uh, it's Dan Harmon who, you know, created did community and Rick and Morty and stuff. But he was like, I wrote this animation script and Spielberg and Geffen love it. And I had this meeting with them and Spielberg looked me in the eyes and said, I love this. I wish we could get it made, but, uh, you know, whatever they had a release deal through universal or whatever for SKG. And he's like, he basically, he basically was telling me, yeah, even if Spielberg wants to make it, it's not up to him. Yeah. Like even that level, people are like, I would love to make this, but I can't, you know, it's not going to happen. Someone else said no. So when I, I had this incredible experience when I was in college, I <clears throat> I was doing this uh, contemporary art class and me being me, I had to write a paper on somebody and the guy I wanted to write about, I actually just wrote and, and you know, got in contact with. And instead of just, you know, so we ended up becoming, you know, acquainted and so i could just interview him and stuff like that instead of just reading out of books because that's sort of the guy i am but i went out to new york and we were hanging out and and he was saying yeah you know he was really hot shot for a while there in the 80s and he was saying but you know I, the work isn't selling so i don't know what to do and he was pretty vulnerable to this college kid right I, i'm not sure what to do and i remember looking at him and i was like well you just keep making work. I mean, I didn't say that, but it's like the work isn't selling. I don't know what to do. You do what you were doing before the work is selling. You just keep making stuff. You know, I mean, isn't that why we're an artist? Is it to sell stuff or is it to make stuff? And um, I think uh, Picasso has this great thing that he said where someone asked him, what do you do when inspiration doesn't come? He says, well, I just make sure that I'm painting so that when it does come, I'm, I'm working, you know? And so the, I think that the, the secret is just to keep doing stuff, you know, and just to keep making stuff and just to keep writing and shooting and, and doing whatever you can to like feel to, to be improving and to be creative, you know? Well, and, and you're, you're doing it. Uh, I, for, well, it's my opinion that you're doing it the right way and you're doing it for all for the right reasons Lord knows, uh, living in L.A., I was born and raised here, so I've met many, many people who are like, you know, moved to L.A. to make it in the film business and, you know, meet them somewhere. And they're like, you know, I really want an office on the studio lot. Right. And I was like, why? Well, because I want to write films. And I'm like, shouldn't you write the films first <laughs> before you start dreaming about driving a, a Range Rover onto the Sony lot? Like, Like, they just... Their goal wasn't artistic. Their goal was status, you know. And that's one of the things that I've that I've kind of kind of figured out. One of my one of the things I look back at is when I when I see that you know I think about that script that I had that kind of got tossed around town and talked about and is I think the worst thing that could have happened to me was that it, I had sold that script. Because because even that sold and was the big buzz script. Well, the next script I wrote was actually really terrible. You know, it was really terrible because I didn't really know what I was doing yet. Right. And so what happens all the time is somebody, you know, gets their agent when they're in their 20s and sells a script, gets on a TV show, whatever, whatever. But they're still learning their craft. Right. But they're learning their craft on the job which is tricky because if somebody says, well, this guy sucks, I'm going to fire him. Let's bring in somebody else. And then they get that happen again. And then that happens again. Well, it's hard to learn your craft and your job when you're getting fired all the time because you don't know your craft. And then, and then you start saying, well, this one worked, right? So, and this is selling. So it, then it starts becoming, I have to write so that I'm getting hired, right? And then that's kind of like a losing game because it's really hard to ever guess where the, the hit's going to be, right? And so and so then it's just kind of a, a tricky thing. And some people figure it out and are really good at it, but other people don't. There's other people that we all know who, you know, were hot for a while, but then they just they weren't ever to sustain it. And And I think... You know, for me, I feel like, I, I don't know who I am to say this, but I feel like, well, you know, 
I mean, writing now is feels like like second nature, you know. And no one's buying my scripts, you know. But but I just you know I just I feel like I'm as good as I've ever been, and uh, you know that I'm just getting started, you know, which is a weird place to be because you know no one wants to hire a 50 year old anyway. But but it's still like this, uh, you know. It's just like I feel very comfortable and competent with my craft right now. And, um, and I've had the luxury of learning it um, without having to, you know, justify myself through salary in a way, you know, anyway. For sure, especially in this last, uh, well, my, my short-term memory is weak, but, you know, it sounds like you've got uh, nearly a decade at, at the university or... No, I only I, I finished my, I just, yeah, yeah, almost a decade. Not quite. Yeah. 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 yeah so in that time, you've really been able to, to focus on, on the work and the art instead of the chase. Right. And you which, also learn by teaching because suddenly you're, you're, you're talking about something and it makes you think about, well, it'd be really interesting if, you know, what if I made a movie this way, you know, in, in a for way sure. that, that that you might not be thinking about if you're not like kind of thinking about some of these concepts. I mean, I'm I'm a much better director because I've taught directing than I was before I'd ever taught directing. You know. Well, I think you just gave me a great segue to mention thirty meetings, thirty days, because I remember from the Q and A that that you wrote that script and made that film because you gave yourself a challenge, right? Like a yeah, yeah. All medium shots, I think. As far as promoting the film, we probably should have started with all this stuff. We've bored our audience so much that if they're still here for 30 meetings, 30 days, then uh, then I'm I'm really appreciative. I have it on very good authority that there are at least five people who love this. Just, no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> but no, it's really honestly, I I don't mean to distract from the subject, but but podcasts are think I think they're popular because the lost art of conversation, like we don't have real world conversations as much yeah. as we'd all like anymore because of these stupid phones and screens and computer. Like yeah, I've never thought of it that way. Yeah. So I think people really enjoy listening to genuine conversations where everyone like we put our phones on do not disturb and we actually talk about stuff that we care about and it's pleasurable. So I think we've still got people listening. Cool. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, 30 meetings, 30 days came about because I was thinking, and again, this thought came, you know, related to teaching, that the hardest cut to make is a cut between a medium shot of one person to a medium shot of the same person. Uh, whether they're just in the same setting or in a different setting, that's a cut that generally doesn't work. And I thought... Huh, that's interesting. Why, how, what would it be if I made a movie that was entirely made out of those cuts? And that was the whole premise of the movie, really artistically, was that every shot is pretty much going to be of a medium shot of the same person. And I thought that idea, and I, I started, um, and almost immediately I, I placed in, uh, I, I, I thought that it would be, um, a woman going through AA. And um, I have experience with um, just uh, um, abusive, self-abusive behavior. And, and I understand AA and I'm not an alcoholic, uh, um, but I've, I've been through a lot of therapy and stuff that's like, has, has brought me to kind of like 12 step programs and stuff like that all the way into my childhood where, you know, my, my dad sort of um, did some sort of counseling with people and stuff like that. Anyway, but, um, but so, so there was a world, somebody asked me, well, what research did you do for it? And I was like, oh, I didn't do any research. For it. <laughs> my life, unfortunately, has been the research, but, um, but the, uh, but the, um, um, but the reason for that was because I knew she would be listening to people. And I knew and I knew I also wanted to isolate her 
in a way. And I wanted like everything to happen kind of outside of the frame of the story itself. So often she's in a meeting and she's just listening to someone, but also the key events of the story itself, such as uh, her alcoholism, the DUI that kind of sent her to court, her court rulings, her all these different things that kind of happen. We kind of see her preparing for them and then we see the result, but we don't really see the event itself. And so, um, so it's like she's kind of, the audience is kind of isolated from these events and has to fill in those gaps. And she's kind of in a box separate from things. And, uh, and so that was sort of all came together aesthetically pretty quick. I wrote the script in pretty much a night and then I tweaked it a few times, you know. Um, and then really the reason it got made was because of my cinematographer, Bianca Klein, who I'd worked with and who I think is brilliant. And I wanted, you know, I'd worked with as a producer. Um, and so I sent it to her and she was like, oh, we've got to make this. You know, she was like, really like, I'm on 100% on board. I was like, oh my gosh, I could direct a movie with Bianca as my DP. And that was just such a privilege and such a exciting opportunity that I just said, okay, I'm, I'm pulling out money from my savings and my, I'm getting a new credit card and I'm going to make a movie, you know? And it'd been a long time because between Super Powerless, which was 2016 and, and, uh, 30 days, which we shot in May of 21. Um, there, I hadn't really made anything. Yeah. And, and super powerless had been uh, a four to eight year process. For yeah. You. And that had been sh the shoot. It had been a while. And so, so I'd made little things here and there and I had um, the things that a couple things that happened is I had a big, we we're just like exactly what we're talking about. I had a big project, um, you know, that had actors attached and everything for a script I'd written and directed and, and uh, you know, a lot, a lot of love about it, but just no one, no one wanted to give us any money for it. And um, and that was ten years, so it was like ten years of my life in development on this thing, you know. And then, and then another project where um, uh, I spent two years. It was a documentary series that I spent two years working with the directors as their main producer. We finally got it to a company that got it to Netflix and it got green lit. But once that company and Netflix were involved, they have all their own producers, you know, all with more, some with more doc experience and others with less, but, you know, they all wanted to have their thing. And suddenly I was like the odd man out and I kind of, I do not have a credit and it came out. I do not have a credit on the film though, but it was two years of pre-production for not really getting to be part of the movie. And I walked off. I didn't get fired. I just, I just felt like it wasn't really ever my project. It was, you know, it was, I was not the, the author of it. You know, it was a project that my friend was very passionate about and I loved, you know, supporting them, my friends. And, um, and so it was just kind of like, I've been regulated to less and less and less. And, and to the point of like, you know, I had found a lot of the people who we were interviewing for this documentary and had nursed these relationships for a couple of years. And then I was going to go to lunch with one of them and I was told I can't, you know, and I'm, I'm not allowed to talk to them without a, one of the other producers. And I was like, wait a minute, you know, so it was just like, it was just like, uh, you know, I just, I just don't even want to be here anymore. And so I just, I just res resigned and, and uh, they were offering me a credit that I said, no, now I probably, you know, I question that, but, uh, but not really. Uh, I hate that story. Actually. I have a, I have a memory I, of, of something. I, I had something similar happen where I was actually told something was moving forward and I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to invite so-and-so to lunch. I think we should like sit down and talk because we're going to work together. And I was told don't yeah. his agent doesn't want you talking to him. Something like that. And it was yeah, like, it's just, it was and, like, and that, why? Yeah, and that sort of thing. And there's, you know, there's, there's just this thing where, where in the industry, you know, people, people really want control. And, you know, and when, and it's one of those sort of pro things where, you know, they don't want, if you're not really on the project, you don't get to, they don't, you don't get to know, you don't get to know what's going on. You don't get to know, get to come in and give notes on the edit and stuff like that. And, 
and I get that, and that's the way the industry is. But it was like, this is my project, you know. This, <laughs> this is, you know, I set up the, we set up this LLC together, you know, to start this thing, you know. And all of a sudden, I'm not on it, you know. And and uh, and it was just kind of, it, it was one of those little feelings where where you're in school and suddenly your best friend starts playing with someone new, and you're not, you know, when you're a kid. And you're jealous because they've got a new friend. <laughs> you know, it's that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, but, who are they to be with that? Even if you like that person, you're like, no, nah, I don't yeah, like him now. But <laughs> yeah. Well, I chose to walk off. I thought about it a long time and I made a choice. And the only time that I've ever really sort of regretted that choice is when it came out and everyone was talking about it. But then six months later, no one's talking about it anymore. You know, and it's that's gone. true. Things don't have the shelf like they used to. They don't. Yeah. And so, you know. And it's just, you know, it was a little emotionally challenging when people were saying, have you seen this? And I was like, yeah, I saw it. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And then you have a little emotional like thing. I want to say that. Yeah, you want to you want to jump and go, by the way. But yes, let me interrupt you and shift your gears back to 30 meetings. Right. <laughs> I like talking to you, John. The, uh, because it's an artistic triumph, I, I'll just say that. Like it's... Uh, besides the way you, the challenge you gave yourself with the medium shots and, but you know, and, and you wanted to work with Bianca Klein, the cinematographer, but also brilliant cast. It's just brilliant. It, it, I mean, it feels like all the pieces for that came together wonderfully. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Bianca, Bianca, the, I, I think the other movie or one of the other things she shot after shortly after she shot uh, my movie was Marcel Lachelle with shoes on. And so that was kind of her big, now she's like, now she's like studio person. Now she's like shooting big stuff. So, so that was a great moment for her. Yeah. It came together really well, really quick. We just got great people on all sides. And that was really it. It was about me wanting to work with all of my favorite craftspeople, you know? So the editor, the, um, the sound team, the cinematographer, I mean, the, the, the sound designer who also did our production sound and the, um, the re-recording mixer is a guy I've worked with as a producer. Well, he also did super powerless, but they're all, they're guys who, you know, who are just like my favorite people to work with. And so, so, uh, you know, super powerless was about making a movie with a friend of mine, right? Joe and Amy, the two stars of that movie are lifelong friends. In fact, Joe, Josiah, who played Bob in Super Pilots, was the guy I was with when I went and saw Star Wars. When we were really? 10, yeah, or 11. And so, so um, and at the end of that movie, I just have this little slogan that says, make movies with your friends. And there's a little picture. If you wait to the very end of the credits, there's a little video from our very first day of shooting a movie when we were 10 years old, myself and several other friends. Son of a bitch! I I I stopped during the credits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't you see just it. Waited a little bit. There's a shot, and there's some guys there, and a couple of those guys actually appear in the movie. They're extras in the background at one point. But I have anyway. to say, now it makes sense to me because I I didn't know you were a Bay Area person, but uh, it's also a bit of a love letter to to the Bay Area. I think for sure. for sure, we go back to Palo Alto, and we we go to some of our real places, and. But anyway, in 30 meetings, 30 days, it was very similar. I mean, I was just working with like, I just, you know, people were working for nothing. I mean, they were doing all me a, fa me a favor, you know, because I wasn't paying anyone very well. But um, but they, um, but it was just about working with my favorite people and the, the artists that I most admired. Now, as far as Emily goes, she submitted, her agent submitted her application. We had 2,000 people submit for the part. And um and she had a uh, she had sort of a step above everyone because I knew her. I knew her work. I didn't know her personally, but I knew I'd seen two films that she had been in, including one that had been directed by a friend of mine. And so I, you know, I auditioned some really great actors and people I've stayed in touch with, actually, because I want to work with again or at some point. And um but, you know, Emily, I knew what I was going to get in Emily. I knew she was going to be fantastic. And I knew just from, you, you, if you watch her body of work, she she's all in. You know she's all in on everything she does. And so I called my friend and she was like, yes, definitely work with Emily. And um, And she really was. She was so great. And she was, I mean, she had to go 
because we we do 30 days in 20 minutes. And so she goes from one, you know, 10 second shot of totally high to another 10 second shot of totally low. And a lot of it's shot in order, you know, I mean, based on location, but we shot, um, what is it? Not consecutively. We shot, what's that called when you shoot in order? Uh, Synchronous? No, no, no. No. Anyway, anyway, but Um, we shot in order, like in the house and we shot in order in the AA room and we shot in, you know, in our locations. And so there were times when she was like this low and this high in the very next shot, the very next setup. Right. And, um, and she, yeah, she pulled it off. She nailed it. Why she isn't like making giant movies. I don't know. You know, I think if you are listening to this, you should look up Emily Goss and cast her immediately. For sure. And, 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 as you said about the medium shots and everything, I mean, it's always her face often in silence, still completely communicating what's going on inside. Uh, It's actually very internal. Her story is very internal, which I always think that that might be another challenge. I don't know if that maybe that wasn't the challenge you gave yourself, but I always, you know, one funny thing to me about screenwriting is is, you know, if you read a lot of novels, we're always inside people's heads. And in film, you know, unless you lean on voiceover, right? you you can't, you know, nothing's worse actually than when a friend gives you a screenplay to read and it's about internal conflict and they don't pull it off because you're like, yeah, guess what? Uh, you, you didn't write a movie. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, but I her performance is so amazing because... You know, even, you know, I love the scene with the children when the children actually kind of go off screen and we're still on her face and we see we see the pain we see we see so much. Yeah, she's so good at that. And that was really what I was auditioning for. We did this. One of my favorite things in any acting performance is watching an actor listen, watching an actor listen to somebody else. And it's really it's something really noticeable when you're editing films when you see an actor who is as interesting to look at when they're listening as it is when they're talking and some aren't some just kind of go vacant when they're when they're you know or they or they just you know they're just like parried like a bird looking at whoever's listening but you don't get anything from them yeah they're getting ready for their next line Right. Uh, yeah. And so that's something that that I and I've often because I've I've done a lot of casting. I've done a lot. Of, I've worked as as a producer for low budget films. I've generally was the casting director as well. And so, um, yeah, I've always thought about that because I've thought when when they're reading and they're reading off of a reader. Really, in an audition, you don't it's all about their lines and it's all about their delivery and it's not about their listing. And I knew in this movie it had to be different. And so we actually did this um, in our casting session. We, we, we narrowed down from 2000 to about 20 people, right? Actually it was about 15 people that we were going to look at. And, um, and in that audition, and we warned them about this, but I had a really great actress, uh, Amy Prosser, who plays uh, Mimi in Super Powerless. I had her at the audition. It was all on Zoom. And I had given her a, a, um, a monologue from Michael Keaton's movie, Clean and Sober, and uh, that Michael Keaton does, does. And I gave it to Amy. And I had Amy read it. And I had this monologue read by my reader, and their assignment, the auditionee, was to listen. And uh, we sat there in the audition. That was a big part of their audition, was listening to this monologue. And I gave them direction. I said, at first, you're resistant. You don't want to be here. But then at some point, something clicks, and you start to really listen to them. And then we would just watch. And that was like one of the most exciting things I've ever done in an audition. And most of it people auditioning agreed you know said the same thing they said that was so cool and uh because that's such a critical acting skill and one that i knew i needed in this and so that was really a big part of the audition 
And so. that's so cinematic, really. Yeah. Um, but, you know, stage plays, it's almost impossible, right? right? Live acting, it's almost yeah. impossible it's to look movie. away from the speaker, right. you know? And, and, and as you pointed out, well, you didn't say it, but, you know, the laziest editing is just going from speaker to speaker to speaker to speaker. So focusing on that cinematic moment of, of human reaction in silence. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, um, and so, yeah. And so, and, and Emily was very good at that. Uh, I had these little tricks I had planned little things to kind of, you know, that were kind of off script, but were a way to kind of convey the emotion she was supposed to be hearing. And she didn't like that. She didn't, I could tell right away that that was not her style. And she already had the, emo she already knew what she wanted to do in, in each of those situations. And we talked about it, you know, we had talked about it in advance, but I didn't need to do much. And we didn't even need to like, sometimes read the read lines off screen or whatever. She could just give me those different emotions. And so, yeah, she was amazing. And she's super awesome. Plus, she's a, a brilliant writer and director herself. She has a short film called The Little House in Aberdeen that played at a lot of festivals. That is just amazing. Yeah. You know, I, I hear that a lot these days. That's one of the joys of doing this podcast is I get to get a little more insight. People share things with me. And and uh, I think those actors who who give writing and directing you know, a shot, whether it's their goal or whether they're doing it for a lark or whatever. And and I think most directors I talk to really appreciate those actors who appreciate and, what it's like to be on the other side. Yeah, yeah, always. Because because filmmaking is a collaboration and you're working with um, you're working with all these artisans, you know, in their different crafts. And it's really nice when the actors themselves understand the nuances of filmmaking, right? And they really get sort of movies, you know? And so it's really nice to work with actors who are really devoted to film, um, as opposed to actors who are just like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a theater actor, but I'll do film too. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting because, you know, I love actors and I love theater myself too but but you know there's something geeky about film that uh that when an actor is like you know passionate about the filmmaking process you know that uh that, that I think I think that makes the working experience really great if it doesn't necessarily make their performance better but it's but I think it could you know for sure well and especially the situation you're in where I'm sure 30 meetings was shot fairly quickly. We shot for three days. Yeah, so 20 minutes in three days. That's actually reasonable. It's not like a breakneck pace, but, but it it's not pretty, like you were going to be able to offer her, uh, know. you know, 20 she takes. Needed, she needed to be on every time, and and uh, and she went all and and you know, and she's on. I mean, she's pretty much on screen the whole movie, and so. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a physical challenge to her. But she's also she talks about um, in one of our Q and A's. Somebody asked her about like acting with a camera right in your face because there's some shots where we, you know, Bianca said, you know, shooting shooting you know these wide angle shots with the camera really close to people make the actor uncomfortable, and that was like intentional. It's like that. So that's a good thing. So let's do that. And um, and uh, and. Emily, however, said that she really likes that. She really likes like interacting with the camera as part of her performance, you know, being aware of the camera and 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 actually doing specific things based on where the camera is at that moment and stuff. And so that's really, you know, just I mean, top top shelf type stuff. It is. It's so impressive because oh Lord knows uh when you're involved, especially at the indie level. Sometimes, you know, actors who are wonderful in auditions and wonderful this and wonderful that, when you put a crew around and a camera, so different. It's so, yeah. and, and it's, it's uh, I've seen so many people crumble in that situation. Yeah. And there's people who are so good. You know, one of my favorite filmmakers is Sean Baker. And so much of his movies are with non-actors, you know, Um Tangerine and Florida Project and and even going back to like 
uh, Prince of Broadway and stuff, uh, almost always he's working with like non-actors and, and um, he's able to really pull that out in them because he's able to, to boil it down to, to a real life situation and what you would do in that situation and, and kind of make the camera go away. And, um, and, uh, um, and then you see others and it's just like the worst act, you know, the horrible, it's just horrible, you know? And so it's really about approach, you know, it's really about approach from the director. And that's the director's responsibility is, is making sure, because you could work with, you know, someone who's like really like professional and trained classical type actor that needs a lot of like, okay, I need you to tone it down. I need you to tone it down. And you sort of, sort of stuff. That's not what you would say, but, and then someone like a child who you need to just make sure it's completely real and they're in their own world, you know, in the same scene. And so that's the response for the director to kind of be aware of both those needs and, and be, you know, making that work. It really is. It really is. It's funny. I'm, I'll share it because I think you'll you'll appreciate it. But I I was lucky enough to go to a before traffic came out, I got to go to a like an IFP screening of it and Soderbergh was doing a QA afterwards. And he said, My first priority as director is to create like a velvet lined slide that the actor can get in and go right where they need to go. Like my he's like, my number one job is to make their job easy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that's not every director's attitude is, is, no, it's not. is, is assisting, you know, is being there for the actor. Some, you know, whatever, I guess the obvious comparison is like Hitchcock, who is like, you know, treat them like kids, but yeah, it, it's, right. uh, you're, you're. Well, Kurosawa said that actors are puppets, you know, and, um, the, yeah, that was, and that was one of the reasons why I really wanted to do 30 Days was to practice that because I hadn't done it since Super Powerless. And that was one of my regrets is not really reading different actors and the way they worked and adjusting my directing to make their performance better and get what I wanted and to be excited about what they were giving me. I was much more into just, you know, it's the first time I'd really directed anything of any sub of length. And um and I and I wasn't I wasn't doing that yet. I wasn't learning that. And so I was so hyper aware of that when I was doing 30 days, 30 meetings, 30 days, that I that I um that I was really proud of myself that early on in day one, I got that resistance from Emily and I was pushing her a lot. But I could tell this this is not her thing. This is not what she wants to do. This is not the way she wants to do it. And I was able to, I was able to pivot. And that I was proud of. I was like, yes, this is exactly what I wasn't doing before. And now I know and I can do it. And I did it. And um, and it was great, you know, and it paid off. So it did. And you had a, I believe you had a fairly superb festival run. Yeah, we uh we we I don't know. It's hard to define that. You know, you talk to people who played at hundreds of festivals and. Well, that means they spent uh, twenty thousand dollars yeah. on, on submissions. <laughs> yeah, because I think the acceptance rate, so percentage is kind of always about the same. I don't know. Um, I played at some good festivals. Um, we premiered at Woods Hole, which was fantastic. Um, really liked being at your festival there in Sherman Oaks. Um, we recently were at. Um, um Cleveland which was sort of the biggest festival we were in and we won and that was a just a great experience uh that's a I mean uh your festival was my favorite Q&A by far that I've ever had so everyone Sherman Oaks you got to submit but also Cleveland was so much fun for like the camaraderie of the filmmakers that's what <laughs> I told people when we left that I felt like I was you know, when I got home, I felt like I'd just come home from camp. You know, you go to camp and you're kind of popular. You make all these new friends and everything. You feel like, you know, you, you feel like important. And then you come home and your life isn't nearly as interesting and you're not nearly as popular. You know, And so and so um, 
we won a we won a cool award at um at Cleveland. It was called the Ophelia Award, and it was an award that they give out every year that is dedicated to it's an audience award. So it's a you know they take the films that kind of were in the he said the top twenty percent of the audience award voting, and um, they do an award and it's an award. Uh, dedicated in the honor of a young woman who died of an, an overdose or something like that in her 20s, some addiction-related sort of thing. And um, and it's called In Celebration of Hope. And it's not just about films that have to do with addiction and recovery. It's just about a film that is that is presenting hope, right? Right, something, yeah, there's, there's yeah, a message and, of hope. My film actually was about recovery and addiction, and, and so it was... Uh, so it was sort of perfect, and um, it was really great. It was really and cool. it, and it has uh, it has the the loveliest of endings, I'd say. I we don't we don't have to give stuff away, but but uh, it certainly, you know, I, I think often the power of a film is 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 how that last feeling felt. Yeah, and uh, and thirty meetings, thirty days. You know, for for you know, it's a it's a rough ride with her at times. And uh, and you certainly give us the anxiety at times, and uh, and actually, yeah, your uh, your 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 actor who uh, who joined you on stage for the Q and A, uh, I have her name, Becca Pruitt. Okay. Yeah, she she was so funny criticizing her own character for being, uh, oh, you know, being the the femme fatale. The femme, I'm like, it wasn't you. It really wasn't you. Uh, she, yeah. you know, but uh, I forget where I was going with that. But yeah, it was. Uh, for for a rough ride, it ends up, you know, honestly, just, just, yeah, very, so hopeful. So, yeah, we have that. We have the. It ends with that that long that long dolly out, right? Which the whole movie has been in medium since that's the first time we've seen any sort of wide shot at all. And you know, the movie's kind of long. It's like twenty minutes, and that dolly out's a couple minutes long. <laughs> it's a long shot, you know. And we're like, you really want to end a short film with this long dolly shot you know and i i remember uh texting bianca my dp saying we're considering cutting out the the dolly shot at the end and she texts back don't you dare <laughs> i was like i'm so glad because i mean i'm about to like get all whatever with you and say like it's just a brilliant final shot because her level of discomfort through the whole process and being forced you know court ordered aa meetings yeah. and and that dolly out is like you give the audience the sense of relief that she just got in that last moment. And it's just it's just uh, ah, it's cinema. It's, yeah. it's storytelling through picture and sound, you know. And, and I think it really wouldn't have worked if we didn't include it. And and then we did that thing with all the voices. Um, that's sort of what I would call a symphony of voices that plays over that which to me kind of helped justify the long dolly because you're actually listening. You know, if, if you're listening to these different people and you're kind of caught up in what they're saying. And, and so you're not like, kind of like what, you know, if it was just a quiet dolly and we were just listening to one person or, or music or something, I don't think it would have worked. And so we made it work. For sure. For sure. And uh, you know, it's wonderful that it's, it's going to be on Amaletto where, I think in general, I, a lot of people get their eyeballs on Amaletto. Yeah. So yeah. It'll get the views it deserves. We're trying to push it out to um like recovery groups and hoping that they're gonna share it and and yeah. that and maybe up the up the numbers a little bit with yeah. that. Yeah, and since Amaletto's not not exclusive, down the road it'll hopefully be part of the Discover Indie Film family and get on there for let's let's for people to, yeah, people to see it. And uh, you know. I I I gotta stop doing stuff like this, but like if you if you had a daddy warbucks in your life, if if there's like I feel like 30 meetings, 30 days is the kind of film that if you'd had, you know, twenty five thousand dollars to throw at one of those Oscar publicists, there, you know, there's those publicists that sp their job is specifically to get short films to the short film committee. Yeah. Like I feel you would have. I think I've been around long enough because I've watched, I've been, mean, you know, 10 years of film festival stuff. And I've seen, I've seen the films that can afford that publicist and the ones that can't. And like, you know, they make top 20, top 10 of that 
best live action short Oscar list. And, you know, it's, uh, I, this is my way of saying it's horribly corrupt that, that it, you actually just have to spend money to get considered. But I think if this film had been under the noses of said, said jury members, you know, it's yeah, just it, high quality. It, I think it, it's such a slow, you know, it starts very, it's a strange film. It's an art film, right? I don't say it's an art film, but it's a experimental. It's certainly experimental. And um, and it felt experimental when we were making it. And so I'm not surprised that there are people who like, who, who when it doesn't get programmed, for instance, because I just think people will say, I'm not sure what I just watched, you know, or if they're not really paying attention to it. You know, they put it on and they're kind of checking their texts and stuff like that. They might just like not even know what this is. Yeah. So it kind of requires a little a little dedication. A little bit. And you need the people who don't. Uh, who care more well, about quality than running time, yeah, I guess is the, what the, I'll say. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you who the, the best reactions. I mean, I've gotten a lot of audiences say that they love it. But the uh, the people who really love it are film people. The filmmakers love it because obviously there's a lot of craft there and there's a lot of sort of thought into the into the craft and and the filmmakers get it and they see what's going on and they they um they tend to I mean that's all my all of my biggest praise has come from my peers, which is great, you know. For sure, for sure. Well, does it uh, make you are you writing all the time? Are you do you have ideas or do you wait for for inspiration? I'm like Picasso. I'm going to make sure that I'm right. In the, I actually just wrote a script last night, a short script that I just got really excited about. Um, I mean, I wrote the rough draft. Uh, I wrote nine pages of rough draft last night. The um, I have uh, I have a several things going on right now. I have two features that are out there trying to be discovered. I mentioned I, I entered one to the Nichols Fellowship. And the other I entered to the, at the to the Austin uh, screenplay competition. I'm not, I'm not, I haven't really done those before. It's a new thing for me. And so I've got both those out and I'm not, you know, really holding my breath. But that's, you know, hopefully I can get somewhere. I, I kind of I just kind of need some I, I kind of need at this point for both a scripts and manager because they're not micro budget things. They're things that people need to look at. And then and then um. And then I have another feature that and a short that I've written that I uh, um, really requires um, the approval of who it's about, right? So it's sort of based on a true story, and I've written it, and I'm I'm building up a proposal package to this person who's a public figure, and if I'm told that they like it, then I might be able to make it, but it, I might just as easily be told, nah, don't do this. I'm, I'm asking permission, right, from this person. So we'll see on that one. And then I just uh, mentioned this uh, script that I had an idea for yesterday that I spent uh, stayed up till two in the morning writing that uh, I'm excited about, based for the very first time on a very autobiographical personal thing. I've never written like that before, where the main character is me at 16. And <laughs> I've given him a different name, but I kept writing Dwayne. <laughs> I kept having to go back and change it. No, it's not Dwayne, it's D. And, uh, but, um, but so, you know, that's down the line and who knows with that, but I do have, I'm just starting a feature that I'm producing with my friend, Josiah Paul Hemus, who was the lead in Super Powerless. And this is a very interesting, um, film. It's called Evergreen and the Effing Spectrum. And it's written, co-written with my friend Josiah, who teaches at a film school um, or a performing arts school that for people with disabilities. So it's written with him by a guy uh, who is um, neurodiverse on the autistic spectrum. And he's really brilliant. Um, and he's written this great script and he's going to direct it. And uh, we're not sure exactly how this is going to look, but Josiah is going to co-direct just to kind of give him the support and the experience. Um, and I'll be producing um, and we're just setting it up. We're a meeting with my lawyer next week to set up an LLC and, and we're going to try to raise money purely through a, um, 
a uh, fiscal sponsor because it's not the sort of money movie that's going to make a ton of money, um, nor is it one that investors are going to be like, oh, this is going to make me money. You know, it's going to be one that people are like, this is a cause that I'm interested in and I want to support. And it's really about his story. It's about his story of trying to become a filmmaker while on the autism spectrum. And um, and I'm excited about it. It's a really great script. So it's the first time I've kind of signed on just to be a producer of something for for a long time. And uh, so, yeah, I got a lot of a lot of a lot of things in the fire. I was talking to just recently um, uh, um, Lauren Hathaway, who made a movie called The Novice that came out a, few, a year or so ago. It's a really fantastic movie. Um, but she had said I had her talking to some of my students and she said making a movie, making movies are like having children in the 1880s. You just kind of have to have a lot of them because you know that most of them aren't going to live to adulthood <laughs> and you love them, but you know that some of them are going to die. <laughs> and I thought that was so brilliant and so perfect that uh, I've been quoting it ever since. So that, I've got that, a lot of young, young nothing children. Nothing is more true. And I remember, I forget, I don't know which guru, maybe it was even some like, I don't forget who it was, but yeah, I remember when I was in college in the eighties and I, there was a, a, a film studies professor he said screenwriting is killing your children because because mm. you got to write that first draft and then you just start got to start killing people off yeah yeah yeah. yeah you gotta be, it is a, it is a brutal art form but then again i'm sure picasso would tell you i've i've ripped up more canvases than i've shared picasso another picasso quote was uh is uh art is as much about destruction as it is about creation I think that you know, a bit too. Uh, I don't know if you can tell. I'm a huge Picasso guy. Oh, good. Which, which, uh, like, like every time I've been to Europe, I've been like just as much Picasso as I can get. But uh, I don't know why I'm bringing it up. But boy, when the Me Too stuff hit, I was like, oh, oh yeah, for sure, yeah. You know, I can't yeah. be too, ju- you know, I can't. I gotta separate the artist from their disgusting side because. Yeah! 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 Yeah, because, it's uh, my crazy. man Pablo he did not treat women well. What can I say? No, he did not. No, he did not. Yeah, yeah it's a tricky thing. It's that's a whole tricky thing because you're, you're, uh, you know, as someone said to me recently, all of our heroes have clay feet. Yeah. So, you know. For sure. All right. Well, feels like you know a feels like a good time to stop. Although we didn't get into the stuff that we we preambled about powerless but uh you know people well, should watch super it it's on YouTube. Is a, super powerless is available on youtube i put it up there you know i had a uh, vod contract you know where it was at all the uh amazon and peacock well i don't know if it was on peacock but amazon and and yeah, like cable and systems and all the different places so you could get on and rent it and then i guess that contract ended and uh it wasn't in, it wasn't available anywhere you know, because there wasn't a DVD that you could buy and there wasn't, you know, all of a sudden you just couldn't see it because once that contract was gone, the movie didn't, wasn't available anywhere. So I was like, screw this. I'm just going to put it on YouTube. And uh, and so that's been great is that I could just say, hey, watch my movie. It's available for free. I mean, it had outlived its time when it was making any money back. Not like it ever made a ton, but, you know, it wasn't really bringing in much. So might as well just get eyes on it. So that's there, and Almoletto will be or will be hosting um, thirty meetings, thirty days for now. And uh, you and I will talk again and get it on your system soon. And and um, yeah, so, so there. Yeah, that's and hopefully right. that person who uh, that public person whose permission you need, maybe they'll watch thirty meetings and uh, go, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, well, no, and absolutely, I will be sending it along as as my work sample for sure yeah i mean it's a wonderful calling card i think yeah thank you excellent well uh oh and well should people well first of all if if you go to youtube people just have to go to duane and that's d-u-a-n-e duane makes movies right is uh your youtube for them to find your stuff yeah i'm at duane makes movies on youtube on facebook on instagram i'm not on twitter I don't have enough to say to be on Twitter, but, um, but, uh, yeah. So D U A N E makes movies. Perfect. All right. Well, 
Well, with that, I will now ramble off the stuff I'm supposed to ramble about uh, to close it out. And how do I do that? I forgot. But good thing is I have notes. All right. Well, you just got to hear Dwayne Anderson talk all about his film, 30 Meetings, 30 Days. 30 Meetings slash 30 Days, if people want to be specific. We never mentioned the slash, actually. But anyhow, we took home six awards at the Sherman Oaks Film Festival. Uh, I think I already mentioned the TV series, but I'll just quickly say thank you for listening to the Discover Indie Film Podcast. There is a TV series that was born out of this podcast because I kept talking to filmmakers and everyone who had a feature, you know, it was on a streaming service. It was somewhere. And everyone who made a short, they really didn't have a home. So, so Amaletto was a wonderful solution to that problem. But my solution to that problem was the Discover Indie Film TV series on Amazon Prime Video. So if people just go to Prime Video, type in Discover Indie Film, you can enjoy seven, possibly by the time you hear this, eight, no, it won't be by the time you hear this, but seven seasons. There might be a seasons eight and nine might come out later this year. And it's just short films handpicked from the festival circuit. So please uh, watch that and like it and give it a nice review. Like and subscribe to the podcast. All right, I think I've said the Discovery New Film stuff I need to. So we mentioned Sherman Oaks Film Festival. We hold that every November. And if you want to learn more, it's Sherman Oaks Film, ShermanOaksFF.com or at ShermanOaksFF on social media. And there is another festival that's coming up on me way too fast called Film Invasion Los Angeles. And you that one we hold every June. So you can learn more if you go to FilmInvasionLA.com or at FilmInvasionLA. And the last thing uh, not mentioned, although it's funny, here, here we talked all about 30 meetings, 30 days, is I did start a thing called TV High because, well, I don't have to go into the whole explanation, but if you go to WatchTVHI.com, uh, it's a new smart TV app slash streaming service where all the content is pretty great to watch if you're stoned or high. It's uh, that's why it's called watchtvhigh.com. <laughs> I always say this at the end of every podcast. I have a lot of friends in recovery. It sounds like you might too, but I have friends in recovery and be responsible with drugs and alcohol. They can ruin your life, but they don't ruin everyone's life. If you can do it in a positive way and you're just unwinding at the end of the day and you can't find shit to watch on Netflix or, or, other services because honestly i sometimes have a hard time finding shit i enjoy in that state give tv high.com uh watch tv high this tv hi it's on it's actually on roku amazon fire stick apple tv android tv ios so iphone and android mobile so it's actually uh you know, I'm hoping this idea takes off. It'd be fun. And actually, it is uh, $4.20 a month if you sign up at watchtvhigh.com. So that's TVHI. And I think that's all I got to say. I think we're good. All right. It's been a pleasure. Been a pleasure. Thank you, Dwayne. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And actually, the podcast right after this one will be fun because you get to hear Dwayne answer the four questions about favorite films and stuff. So thank you, everyone, for listening. Yeah.